Hello, welcome to the webinar. My name is Jesse Xie. I'm AWS Solutions Architect for EC2 Spot. Today with me is Scott Horsfield. He's the worldwide EC2 scalability lead. Today, we're going to share with you how to run efficient and resilient workloads at scale with Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling and Amazon EC2 Spot. So you may ask questions by typing in the chat or you could wait until the end of the Q&A sections. So today we have three learning objectives. The first one is to learn how to build resilient workloads with EC2 auto scaling and EC2 spot. Second is to learn how to optimize auto scaling groups with multiple instance types and purchase options. The last goal is to learn how to configure auto scaling groups to access new EC2 features. So let's begin with reviewing the current available EC2 purchase options. Most of our customers start with on-demand purchase option. That, that is for spiky workloads. You pay for the compute you consume by the second. There's no long-term commitment. If you do have long-term commitment and you have predictable and a steady state usage, you may be able to take advantage of the significant discount up to 72% of compute by using the savings plan. And for those short-term spiky workloads that is also fault tolerant, flexible, and stateless, it's good to use spot instances. Spot is a spare EC2 capacity that offers you up to 90% off on-demand price. So spot instances are perfect for those fault tolerant and flexible and stateless spiky workloads because you can achieve a significant discount. And this is a great for those workloads like containers, big data, CICD, batch, web services, machine learning, and high performance computing. This is a very important to understand that a spot, because spot is a spare capacity and spot and on demand are sharing the same instance pools. So this is a fundamental concept to understand how these pools work. An instance pool is a collection of identical EC2 instance types. So in this example, we're using C5 as a, in the compute family, fifth generation. So every instance family each instance size in each availability zone in every region is a separate pool. So they are independent of each other. So as you can imagine, if you are able to select from multiple instance families and from multiple AZs and different sizes and also different uh, architecture like Intel, AMD, or Graviton, that will give you more uh, instance pools versus if you only restrict yourself to only like, for example, two AZs and three sides of one type, which is only six pools. So the more instance pools you select, the more chances you will be able to allocate and launch your instances and see less interruption rate. Because the nature of spot, this is a spare capacity. This means whenever the EC2 needs the capacity back, AWS will reclaim the spot instances and AWS will give you a two minutes warning ahead of the time. So this warning will be arrived in the instance itself, metadata in the event bridge. And you can um, preset your behavior, how to handle those uh, interruptions. You can either set it to be terminate or stopped or hibernate. So in the past three months, we have observed that less than 5% of spot instances were interrupted. So that means indeed more up to 95% of those inter spot instances were actually terminated or stopped by customers themselves because they are finishing their jobs. So that said, it's very important that your workloads are very flexible, fault tolerant, and flexible. 
So flexible is the key to successful stop, spot adoptions. That in terms of instance, time, and region. If you are able to select multiple instance types, like I mentioned earlier, from different family, generation, sizes, and infrastructure, then you will have a more chance of building up a resilient clusters of different instance types. And, and also, if you are able to be time and location flexible, overall, you will see less interruption and you can maximize your application uptime. So there are three allocation strategies to help you to select and launch EC2 instances. So I will go do an overview, and Scott will cover much more in details later. So the first one is for on-demand type. For on-demand, we have prioritized list allocation strategy. So this you will first put in the override list of your prioritized list of a preferred instance type you want to allocate in the order of preference. And then this strategy will launch in the order to uh, according to these uh, selections. So for example, you have R5 large as the first one and M5 large as the second one. Then this allocation strategy will launch according to the priority order. First, R5 large, second, M5 large. This is the strategy for spot instances. We recommend this capacity optimized allocation strategy as the spot best practice because this strategy will pick the instance from the deepest pool of what you preferred uh, instance types that you listed in the override, override list. So in this case, you see the list, you put three instance types, but the order does not apply because, again, this is using the capacity optimized strategy to do the selection. In this example, in the first AZ, it's the US East 1A, the longest bar refers to the deepest pool because the R5 large is the deepest pool. Therefore, this allocation strategy will pick this R5 dot large to allocate for the first AZ. And then move on to the second AZ and pick whatever the deepest pool in there, which is the M4 large. The next allocation strategy for spot is lowest price. For this strategy, you can define the numbers of the pools you wanted to pick from. So this strategy will pick the lowest price from the number of the pools you select out of the list of instance types you put in the override list. So in this example, like a $1 sign means the lowest price, the $2 sign is the second lowest price, and because we defined for two pools, therefore for 1A, it will load, uh, launch the R5 large and M4 large, and then for the second, AZ 1B, it will pick the M5 large and R5 large because those are the two lowest priced. And you may have noticed that this price, lowest price strategy, only looks for the price as a criteria to launch the instances. So it does not consider the depth of the pool. So therefore, we always recommend, if possible, use the previous allocation strategy, which is the capacity optimized allocation strategy for spot in order for you to see the lowest interruption. So here, this EC2 instance rebalance recommendation for spot instances, this is one of the most significant recent new spot features. This is a signal that will notify you when a spot instance is at elevated risk of interruption. This signal can arrive sooner than the two minutes of the original spot instance interruption notice. This will also arrive at the same place as the original two minutes interruption notice will show up in the metadata of the instance itself or and in the event bridge. So this signal 
gives you the opportunity to proactively rebalance your workloads. So now you can rebalance your workloads onto some other spot instances that are not at elevated risk. And you can prevent scheduling new workloads on those elevated risks because you don't want it to be interrupted very soon. Also, this, this new signal can let you to start doing your checkpointing of your work early in order to save more state. And Scott will talk more about how to use this signal along with auto scaling group for better workloads management. And next feature is spot placement score. This is another one of the most significant recent new spot release features. So this signal helps customers to select optimal locations. So what you can do is you provide a list of your preferred instance types that you would like to launch and then run this score. And this will return with a score of up to uh, 1 to 10. And you can filter by the different regions and availability zones. So the higher score, that ref means that you have a more likely of launching those instance types successfully and therefore less likely to be interrupted. So you can use this feature to dynamically scale and move around your workloads. However, this new feature is just for reference. This does not provide any capacity guarantees. This is, uh, serves as an informational recommendations only. So you can have a better idea which location is better than other locations. And if you are able to launch this amount of uh, instance types in terms of uh, amount or vCPUs or memories. So overall, we highly recommend you to always remember to apply all the spot best practices, including using all the availability zones in each region and be very flexible not only your workload must be fault tolerant, flexible, and uh, uh, also you need to be very flexible in the instance types itself. Select from multiple different family, different sizes, different generation, and different infrastructure of uh, Intel, AMD, or ARM. And also, if you are be able to be time and region flexible, that will be all adding to your success of adopting EC2 spot to achieve cost optimization. So now let me turn over to Scott, who will be talking about auto scaling. Hey, thanks, Jesse. That was a great overview into the best practices for requesting uh, EC2 capacity, either spot instances or on-demand instances. Uh, so now that you have an overview of how to do that, we're going to dive into a bit more detail and go over some best practices and features that you can start to take advantage of in your auto scaling groups today to bring more resiliency and efficiency to your workloads. Specifically, we're going to cover five best practices and the features around those best practices that can help you build more resilient workloads at scale. First, we'll cover launch templates and mixed instances policies and dig into a bit more detail about what those are. We'll talk about enabling capacity rebalancing which helps you take advantage of that rebalance recommendation signal that Jesse covered and proactively replace instances that are at an elevated risk of interruption. Then we'll talk about scaling your workloads with scaling policies. We'll cover the different types of scaling policies and when to choose uh, one over the other. Then we'll talk about scaling rapidly with warm pools. So how you can have pre-initialized capacity available to your auto scaling group so that you can scale more quickly. Lastly, we'll talk about automating deployments with instance refresh. It's a great feature that can help you ensure that the instances running in your auto scaling group are always running with the latest configuration. Today in EC2 auto scaling groups, there are two resources that you can create that define the instance properties of the instances that are launched as part of your auto scaling group. The first is launch configurations. You might be familiar with them and you may be using them today in your auto scaling groups. And introduced in 2017 is the successor to launch configurations, launch templates. Launch templates bring some uh, additional benefits to EC2 auto scaling over launch configurations. For example, they can help increase productivity by introducing the concept of versioning. This means that in an EC2 auto scaling group, you can point to a specific launch template version, 
You can point to a default launch template version, or you can point to the latest launch template version. That means that as instances are launched, they can always pull the latest instance properties um, as they're being brought into service. They also introduce a simplified permission model, meaning that you can create IAM roles and policies that restrict different teams within your organization uh, from launching instances that do not adhere to specific launch template parameters. This can help with governance and just ensuring that best practices are followed in your environments. They also provide a consistent experience across uh, multiple services, unlike launch configurations. So you can use launch templates across EC2 autoscaling. You can also use them with EC2 fleet or some of their other APIs for launching instances. And you can use them across other AWS services, such as AWS Batch. But the most important thing that they introduce is the concept of mixed instances policies and the ability to combine multiple instance types and purchase options when configuring autoscaling groups. So with mixed instance types and purchase options, this means that you can implement the best practices that Jesse covered in her section in a single autoscaling group. Prior to this, you had to create multiple autoscaling groups if you wanted to combine spot instances and on-demand instances, but now you can combine those into a single autoscaling group. Um, combined with that, autoscaling groups also have a number of features that can just help you maintain a more resilient and efficient and fault tolerant workload. For example, the replacement of unhealthy or interrupted instances. So as instances are interrupted because EC2 needs capacity back, uh, the autoscaling group will automatically replace those instances for you so that you don't need to do any sort of heavy lifting to ensure that, that you have uh, the number of instances running for your workload uh, that you need at any given time. You can also perform health checks and ensure that the instances running as part of your autoscaling group are healthy. Uh, the autoscaling group will also balance your capacity across availability zones. So when you configure an autoscaling group, we recommend that you configure it to uh, ha have access to multiple availability zones. And the autoscaling group will handle launching instances balanced across those availability zones so that you have a fault tolerant and highly available application. They also integrate with elastic load balancers. So if you have an application that is hosting a, a web application or maybe an API and you need to have your customers access that service through a load balancer, autoscaling groups can automatically handle the registration of load balancers for you. They also have some additional features uh, that help with just managing the overall lifecycle of instances. Lifecycle hooks, for example, give you the ability to tap into the instance launch and termination process and perform custom actions. So for example, if you need to ensure that an application is completely installed and running, uh, and healthy before that instance is brought into service, you can create a lifecycle hook, execute some custom code, and ensure that that instance is brought into service in the right state. We also have some features like termination policies and instance termination protection to just ensure that during scale in events, the right instances are terminated, and we don't terminate instances that are maybe performing work or processing uh, data as part of your application. And one of the best features is that they give you access to scaling policies. So many customers use auto scaling groups with a static capacity, um, but we do recommend customers look into implementing scaling policy to really take advantage of elasticity. So the ability to scale up and scale down based on the demand that's placed on your workload. And we'll talk a bit more about scaling policies here in a moment. So again, just to recap some of these changes, uh, before launch templates uh, and the introduction of mixed instances policies, uh, if you had uh, a need to follow some of the best practices that we've been talking about and wanted to um, combine M4 spot instances, for example, and M5 large spot instances and C4 large on-demand instances, you needed to create three separate auto-scaling groups and you needed to manage the, um, the routing of traffic between the applications hosted within those auto-scaling groups. With the introduction uh, of launch templates and mixed instances policies, you can do that with all, all within a single auto scaling group. So this can significantly simplify uh, your workload and ensure that your workload is following the best practices and also give you the opportunity to start to optimize in ways that you haven't optimized before. So start to introduce spot instances in a safe and controlled manner. We'll talk more about how you can do that. Uh, but then also you know, think about uh, what types of instances can my workload run on 
and add more instance types to your uh, auto scaling group configuration so that if there is any sort of capacity issue, you always have a fallback option that you can use to, to launch your instances on. So next is capacity rebalancing. So Jesse talked uh, about a, a feature called a rebalance recommendation signal. So this is a signal that's emitted um, when we detect that an instance is at an elevated risk of being interrupted. So if you're running spot instances, you may be familiar with the spot interruption notification. This is that two minute warning that that instance is going to be interrupted uh, and is going to be reclaimed by EC2. The rebalance recommendation signal can come in advance of that and give you kind of a heads up warning that, hey, we, we think this instance is at an elevated risk of being interrupted. Now, auto scaling groups can capture that signal and then automatically and proactively replace the instances that are at an elevated risk of being interrupted. So what this means is as that signal is detected by the auto scaling group, the auto scaling group can launch a replacement instance. Uh, it can execute any lifecycle hooks or any um, configuration or pre-initialization actions that you have configured for that instance, bring that instance into service, and then terminate the instance that was at an elevated risk of interruption. It'll automatically handle things like deregistration and registration with load balancers. And when it launches the replacement instances, it uses the allocation strategies that Jesse covered, um, specifically, uh, for example, using capacity optimized allocation strategy. So if an instance is at an elevated risk of interruption, you want to ensure that the replacement instance is not going to be at an elevated risk of interruption. So that capacity optimized allocation strategy allows us to use real-time capacity insights to launch instances from the deepest capacity pools available. Um, let's kind of go into how this all comes together in, in the form of uh, an EC2 auto scaling group configuration. I'm going to show how this might look if you're creating a cloud formation template uh, or um, some sort of uh, you know, a configuration file that you were going to use uh, for an API call to create an auto scaling group. But these same concepts apply if you're using the AWS console. So first, in your auto scaling group configuration, you want to add a mixed instances policy. So this allows EC2 to combine spot instances and on-demand instances and create uh, an override list of instance types that are uh, acceptable to your workload. And you want to provide that override list as many instance types as you can that you think your workload can successfully run on. So for example, in this configuration, you know, we have a workload that we know runs on C5 larges, but there are other instance types that have a similar memory to CPU ratio that our application can also run on. So we add those instance types to the list so that our spot allocation strategies can look across all of those instance types to launch instances from the deepest capacity pools available, but also so our on-demand prioritized allocation strategy um, has the option of uh, retrying instance launches. Um, by crawling down that list and, and launching instances in the order that they're provided. So this is a great way for both spot instances and on-demand instances. Uh, and you can use this to just create more resiliency within your workload. Now in the mixed instances policy, you can figure some options around capacity. And you do this in the form of an instances distribution. So spot instances and on-demand instances are, um, are, the capacity for each of those is handled independently of each other. And you do this in the form of, of three parameters. So you have an on-demand base capacity. So this is the, the number of on-demand instances that are going to be launched to achieve the auto scaling group's desired capacity first. So here we have an auto scaling group that has a desired capacity of 12 and an on-demand base capacity of three, meaning the first three instances as the auto scaling group tries to fulfill capacity up to that 12 are going to be on-demand instances. Then you have an on-demand percentage above base capacity. So this is the percentage of instances above that base capacity that will be on-demand instances. And in this case, we have 25%. So our auto scaling group has a desired capacity of 12. The first three instances are going to be on-demand. Then 25% of the remaining instances will be on-demand. The other 75% will be spot instances. And then you have a spot allocation strategy. And here we're showing the best practice that we recommend customers implement, which is using the capacity optimized allocation strategy. So what this configuration does is it, is it gives you an auto scaling group that has a on-demand base capacity. Um, that base capacity 
is covered uh, you know, by on-demand instances. And then you can use something like savings plans to further optimize the cost of those on-demand instances. And then as that auto-scaling group scales up, it's going to scale up with spot instances. Lastly, for uh, your auto-scaling group configuration, because we are using spot instances, enable capacity rebalancing. Uh, that allows, again, that auto-scaling group to intercept that rebalance recommendation signal and then proactively replace any instances that are an elevated risk of interruption. Now, in the, the section that we just covered, we talked about providing a list of instances. And so that's something that, that you would have to manually update as your instance profile changes. We're excited to introduce uh, attribute-based instance selection. This is a new feature that allows you to, instead of supplying a list of instance types, express instance requirements as a set of instance attributes, for example, vCPU, memory, or network IO. So you can specify the number of uh, vCPUs. You can specify the amount of memory that your applications need or your workload needs. And then we will create a list based off of those parameters and use that to configure your auto-scaling group. This means that you don't have to manually curate a list of instance types. And when you configure your auto-scaling groups, you're always getting the latest uh, number of instance types and, and sort of the latest, you know, greatest amount of instances available uh, to configure that and, and create that most, you know, as create as well diversified of an auto-scaling group configuration uh, as you can. So uh, if you have any instance types that you absolutely do not want to use, so if you, if you know, for example, that your application uh, just has issues with a specific instance type, you, you do have the ability to exclude instances from the results of, uh, of, results of what's selected uh, by, the, by uh, attribute-based instance selection. So you have full control over the instances that you're running, uh, but this can reduce the amount of hands-on time that you need to spend maintaining your auto-scaling group configurations. Next, we're going to dive into how you can scale your workloads with scaling policies. So I mentioned that many customers have auto-scaling groups that have fixed capacity, or maybe they manually update capacity as their needs change. But we have some scaling policies that are available that can automate that process for you, either in response to traffic or in response to, to known events. Let's dig into those in a bit more detail. Now we're going to go over the types of scaling policies that are available to you to maintain the EC2 capacity within your EC2 auto-scaling group. First, I'm gonna talk about two policies that we refer to as dynamic scaling policies. Now, these are scaling policies that are reactive in nature. This means is that um, in response to different CloudWatch metrics or alarms, um, capacity is added or removed from those auto-scaling groups. The first types of these policies, simple or step scaling policies, allow you to manually calculate your capacity and allow you to create policies that have fine grained control over the number of instances that are added or removed to your auto scaling group in response to different uh, CloudWatch events or, or alerts or CloudWatch metrics or alerts. Now, if you want fine grained control over the infrastructure that's added to your auto scaling group, this is a great option for you. So you have full control, uh, but that comes with the downside of you needing to know how many instances you need to add in response to different uh, threshold breaches within your policy configuration. So you need to know as uh, your application load or receives more load that five instances is going to be enough to, um, to uh, support the load that's being placed on that auto scaling group. Now, if you want a more automated experience, uh, we recommend looking at target tracking. So target tracking brings a more thermostat-like control uh, mechanism to your scaling policies. So rather than having to manually calculate capacity and manually define those steps, you provide a customer-defined target, and the auto-scaling group and the scaling policy will automatically add or remove instances to maintain that target. So for example, if you wanted uh, the instances in your auto-scaling group to have an average of 60% CPU utilization, you would define that as a target, and the auto-scaling group would automatically add or remove instances to achieve that target. The next type of scaling policy is scheduled scaling. So this is a more proactive way to um, add capacity to your auto-scaling group. Many customers use this um, as a way to add capacity in advance of events. So for example, if you have a product launch, or if you have a data load or some sort of known process that's going to execute at a specific uh, time, you can create scheduled scaling events and have capacity added to that auto-scaling group in advance of those events. 
This is a more proactive way, again. So this is uh, instead of reacting to CloudWatch metrics and CloudWatch alerts, you are adding capacity in advance of the load being placed on your workload so that you're confident that your application can handle that load. It's still a manual process, however. So you need to manually calculate the pack capacity that you're going to be adding or removing. You need to you know, do work to ensure that uh, you um, keep those numbers updated over time as your load profile changes. So if you're experiencing growth within your products, you need to ensure that you're going and updating your scheduled scaling policies uh, to increase or decrease the number of instances uh, that are being added or removed. Now, if you'd like a more automated experience, uh, we launched uh, predictive scaling as a native scaling policy uh, in EC2 auto scaling this year. So previously, uh, Predictive scaling has existed in the AWS auto scaling service. It's now available in EC2 auto scaling as a native scaling policy. Now what predictive scaling can do is it can look at historic load patterns on your auto scaling group and the resources within your auto scaling group, and then calculate and forecast the capacity needed to uh, meet those load patterns in the future. So using a machine learning model, uh, we are forecasting the number of instances required to uh, support the load that has been placed on that auto scaling group in the past. So let's dig into this in a bit more detail. So predictive scaling policy proactively manages capacity for you. So it looks at those historical trends and then it adds or removes instances based on those historical trends. This can help you reduce over provisioning. So if you have an auto scaling group and you have known events and you uh, maybe are adding more instances uh, than is going to be required to support the load that you're receiving on that auto scaling group. Uh, predictive scaling um, is instead looking at the actual load that has been placed on that auto scaling group. So it's looking at the actual load that you've served and then it's basing its forecast on that historic load that you've received on that workload. So this means that the, the forecasted numbers are going to reflect the number of instances that you're actually going to need to support your workload, um, you know, potentially reducing over provisioning and reducing costs in the process. Now, they still work within defined boundaries. So in your auto scaling group configuration, you've probably set a minimum a number of instances and a maximum number of instances. The predictive scaling policy will, will still work within those boundaries. So you have full control uh, and confidence as you're creating your predictive scaling policy um, to not uh, deviate from those boundaries. And when you create a predictive scaling policy, you can create that predictive scaling policy in something called forecast only mode. What this allows you to do is to create the predictive scaling policy, um, maybe create multiple scaling policies using different metrics, and then look at the results um, of the forecast that those policies generate, and then choose the right policy for your workload without making any changes to the capacity that's actually running in your auto scaling group. So this is a great way to build confidence with predictive scaling and ensure that it's uh, you know, going to launch the right number of instances um, to meet the needs uh, of your workload. Then once you're confident in your scaling policies and you've uh, refined them and, and reviewed them and based them on the right metrics, you can switch that to forecast and scale mode. And then the uh, scaling policy will start to automatically adjust uh, your capacity over time. Now, the great thing about this is this, this is not a one-time process. Predictive scaling is always learning uh, based on the load that's being received from your workload. So as your uh, load profile changes over time, your predictive scaling policy is able to adjust its forecasts over time, uh, ensuring that you don't need to go and manually update uh, your scaling policies. You don't need to go back and uh, revisit the configuration and a number of instances that you've configured. Uh, it's going to do that automatically over time for you. Now, some use cases where we see customers taking advantage of predictive scaling, uh, recurring load spikes. So if you have known patterns um, of load that are being placed on your workload, uh, this is a great way to um, scale in advance of those, um, those spikes, uh, but doing so in a very uh, proactive and automated fashion. We also see customers using this as an alternative to manually scaling. So instead of having to go in and update and, and, and modify and change you know, your uh, scheduled scaling policies based on the, the load profile changes in your workload, uh, you can let predictive scaling learn um, from those behaviors and learn from the load that's being handled by your workload and update automatically itself. 
Now, for applications that have a long initialization time, you can configure a predictive scaling policy to launch instances in advance of a particular load spike. So you can have instances launched in advance. You know, for example, if your instances take 10 minutes in order to boot up um, and be fully configured and ready, you can configure that in the predictive scaling policy and have those instances ready and available to serve your traffic as it's needed. Now, another great way to uh, optimize your autoscaling groups and the instances in your autoscaling groups is with warm pools. So the, in that last example, I mentioned a scenario where you might have an instance that takes 10 minutes uh, to boot up and configure. Well, warm pools are a feature that we launched this year that allows you to have pre-initialized capacity uh, ready and available to you and uh, ready and available to the autoscaling group so that when the autoscaling group uh, scales up, uh, that capacity can be pulled from that warm pool from that pre-initialized capacity, rather than having to initialize those instances from scratch. Uh, what this can lead to is just faster scaling. So if you have a, a pool of instances associated with your auto scaling group, and all the instances in that pool have been pre-initialized, um, and then either kept in a, a stopped or running state, and I'll talk more a bit uh, about that configuration here in a moment. When the auto scaling group needs to scale up in response to a scheduled scaling event or a dynamic scaling policy or a predictive scaling policy, uh, it can pull those instances from that warm pool and bring them into service uh, more rapidly than it would if it needed to uh, launch those instances from scratch and have them complete all of their initialization actions uh, as they were being brought into service. Now, this can help you just increase uh, the elasticity of your workload. This is an important concept to consider. You know, the faster you can bring instances into service, the faster you can respond uh, with those reactive scaling policies uh, to the traffic demands that are being placed on your workload. It also helps uh, reduce underutilization. So uh, to get around long boot times um, for workloads that have them, some customers over-provision their auto-scaling groups and launch more instances than they need to uh, in order to um, buffer themselves from needing additional instances but not wanting to incur the cost of long pre-initialization times. So because those instances are already pre-initialized and they can be brought into service faster, you can run your autoscaling groups with the true capacity needed to serve traffic at any given point in time, but with the confidence that you can bring instances into service rapidly as you need them. Now, these help um, just create more accurate scaling metrics in your autoscaling groups. So the instances that are in the warm pool do not contribute to the autoscaling group metrics uh, of the instances that are running in your autoscaling group. So the instances that are in the warm pool are not contributing to things like average CPU utilization across your autoscaling group. Uh, because you have you know, more accurate scaling metrics, but you also have capacity that's readily available for you, this means your scaling policies are just that much more refined and that much more accurate uh, and can respond that much more faster to the, the demands being placed on your workload. Now, you might be running, you're wondering, you know, if I have this pool of instances available to me, uh, how, how does that save me money? Like, how does that help, you know, me op optimize my cost or, or optimize my efficiency? Well, you can keep those instances in either a running state or you can stop them. So you can have instances pre-initialized and then stop those instances once the pre-initialization has completed uh, and no longer pay for the running compute cost of those instances. Now, when instances are launched, in an auto scaling group that has a warm pool configured, uh, they're going to be launched and then launched into the warm pool first. And this is where we recommend you look at lifecycle hooks as a way to manage the actions that are being taken on those instances as they're being launched into the warm pool. So, for example, uh, you have an application that has a long initialization time. As the instance is being launched into the warm pool, you know, have that instance, have the auto scaling group configured with a lifecycle hook. And then as that instance is launched into the warm pool, you have the option through that lifecycle hook to uh, configure uh, the application, uh, do any sort of installation or just health checking or, or anything that you need to do to ensure that that uh, pre-initialization is complete. And then um, mark that lifecycle action is completed so that it, the instance can be brought into the warm pool and then stopped. Then as the instance leaves the warm pool and moves to the autoscaling group, you, you still have access to that lifecycle hook as well. So that means, um, as an instance is launched into the warm pool, you can ensure that it's pre-initialized and configured. And then as an instance is moved from the warm pool into the auto scaling group, 
you can ensure that your application is started and is healthy before it's brought into service. Now, uh, once configured, these are very easy to maintain. Uh, we do you know, all the work to launch instances into the warm pool and ensure that that warm pool has the number of instances in it that you've defined. And we'll, we'll talk more about those parameters here in a moment. Uh, so there's not a lot of operational overhead that you need to worry about for maintaining the instances in that warm pool. Now, some use cases that we see customers using this for, uh, firstly, Windows AMIs. So if you have Windows applications um, that maybe need to do something like a domain join, you could have those instances launch, do the domain join as they're entering the warm pool, and then stop those instances that you're saving on cost, but have those instances readily available in the warm pool so that once your auto scaling group needs to scale up, the instances that are already domain joined, already configured, already pre-initialized can be brought into service. So that can really help speed up the launch time of instances um, for some of those workloads where you have just those long pre-initialization times. Also useful um, for workloads where you have large AMIs. So if you're baking large AMIs that have a lot of custom configuration, uh, maybe some commercial software, a lot of custom code within them, and they're very large, um, just having those already initialized, already launched, um, and already ready, uh, but in a stop state or, or a running state, if, if your use case uh, necessitates that, um, it can help you speed up that launch time even further. Uh, and then lastly, custom scripts. So if you have uh, you know, a user data script that's performing a lot of pre-initialization actions, you can have all of those pre-initialization actions completed and those instances uh, available to be brought into service rapidly. So here's an auto scaling group that's going to be in, been configured with uh, an EC2 auto scaling warm pool. So our auto scaling group and our warm pool configuration are, are kind of separated into two buckets. So we have our auto scaling group configuration, and here we have an auto scaling group with a desired capacity of three, a minimum capacity of three, and a maximum capacity of ten. So as this auto scaling group is created, uh, initial instances are launched. We should get three instances balanced across the three availability zones that we've configured for this auto scaling group. Now we've also configured a warm pool for this auto scaling group. We specified a pool state. So this is the state that instances are in uh, within that warm pool. And today that is uh, the running state or the stop state. We specified a, a minimum size uh, for that warm pool. So the warm pool is gonna try to always keep two instances here uh, available for us, you know, as instances are moved into an, uh, into our, sorry, into or out of the warm pool. And then a maximum prepared capacity of 12. So this is the total number of instances that are available running within the auto scaling group or in the warm pool in either a stopped or running state. So as this auto scaling group comes up, instances are going to be launched. We'll get the three instances across um, three availability zones just to achieve our desired capacity. And then we would have nine instances brought into the warm pool and then kept into a stop state. Then as we changed our desired capacity, those instances um, would be launched from the warm pool uh, into the auto scaling group instead of being launched from scratch. So we would have instances launched much more rapidly uh, without uh, having to go through initialization again because they've already gone through an initialization process. So the last best practice we're gonna cover is automating instance deployments with instance refresh. And this is one of those features that, that really requires you to be uh, on launch templates. And that's why it's so important that for your auto scaling groups, you start to make that transition from launch configurations to launch templates. So uh, when you have an auto scaling group and you update the launch template versions, the instances that are running in that auto scaling group do not automatically terminate and refresh with the latest configuration or latest version of your launch template. Uh, customers often have um, pipelines or custom code that handles that deployment process for them. Or they might rely on just you know the elasticity of the auto scaling group to um, bring that auto scaling group configuration up to date over time. So as instances are terminated uh, and then new instances are launched, the instances that are launched are going to be launched with the latest configuration. Now, if you want to force a refresh of all the instances uh, in your auto scaling group, you can use a feature called instance refresh. So what this allows you to do is keep all the instances running in your auto scaling group up to date with the latest launch template version. So you might have a, a pipeline that creates a new AMI um, as patches are available to your applications. You might um, you know, run through some sort of process to generate that AMI 
and then upgrade update the launch uh, templates for your autoscaling groups with a, an updated AMI, which would create a new launch template version um, that your autoscaling group could pick up. Now you can force that refresh using this feature, and that can allow you to get out of having to have custom code or custom pipelines um, that you manage and that your teams create and have to update and support uh, to handle that refresh for you. So you have full control over the entire uh, refresh process. So you can always ensure that you have enough instances running in your auto scaling group to, uh, to keep your workload um, in the state that you want it to be in to serve the traffic that uh, you're experiencing. So you can specify parameters like a minimum healthy percentage uh, to just ensure that you have a certain number of instances always available uh, in that auto scaling group. You can configure an instance warm up time. So, just how long does it take uh, for your instances to initialize? And then, if you need a further control, you can configure something called checkpoints. So, without checkpoints enabled uh, with a configuration um, as we see here in this screen, uh, the instance refresh would just run until it was completed. So, it'd run until all the instances in that auto scaling group were refreshed. But for some customers, they want more control over that refresh process. So, we introduced uh, checkpoints. What these allow you to do is, is create percentage-based um, thresholds or phases uh, for the instance refresh process, meaning that you could uh, work through your instance refresh maybe in thirds. So you could have uh, the first third uh, you know, of, of, your, of your total EC2 capacity in your auto scaling group refreshed. Then a, an event would be admitted to event bridge. You could respond to that event um, either in an automated fashion through something like a, a Lambda function, or you could have that event send a notification through an SNS topic to let somebody know that they needed to do some sort of uh, manual evaluation of the deployment or the refresh process. And then you can tell the instance refresh to continue. So that just gives you the ability to kind of work through an instance refresh in phases rather than waiting for the instance refresh to run from start to finish and just replace all the instances in one, in one fell swoop. So wrapping up, let's go over some of the, the lessons that, uh, that uh, we hope you learned today and some of the best practices that we recommend that you take back to your workloads and start to implement. So first, you know, use launch templates and mix instances policies, uh, not just to combine purchase options, but also to take advantage of the latest EC2 uh, features and auto scaling group features. So launch templates, those are gonna give you access to things like instance uh, refresh, but they're also gonna give you the ability to diversify the instance types that you request in your auto scaling group. So we recommend if you're running launch configurations today, look into ways that you can start to, to migrate to launch templates. Uh, in the EC2 console, uh, there is a button available to you to copy your launch configuration to a launch template. So it should be a, a pretty simple and automated process for you to do that. Once you've done that, you know, lean on spot instances to start to introduce um, you know, optimization and efficiency to your workloads, especially for those workloads that are fault tolerant, flexible, uh, or stateless. So your containerized workloads, your big data workloads, your CI CD pipelines, uh, your HPC workloads, your batch workloads. Um, look at those and look for opportunities to introduce spot instances. And you can use the mixed instances policies and the instance distribution to safely introduce spot instances in a way that you're comfortable with into those workloads and start to really uh, gain the benefit of that savings uh, up to 90% off of on-demand. Now, as you start to introduce spot instances, take advantage of the allocation strategies especially the capacity optimized allocation strategy to ensure that the instances that you're launching are always from the deepest capacity pools available. So really important that, uh, that you leverage those best practices um, just to ensure that you're reducing the chance of being interrupted uh, for your workload. Then enable capacity rebalancing, let the auto scaling group intercept that rebalance recommendation signal and um, proactively replace instances that are an elevated risk of interruption. Also, start to look at ways that you can introduce scaling policies into your workload. So if you have a workload today and you're manually updating capacity or changing capacity based on known events, maybe you can introduce predictive scaling. Uh, let predictive scaling start to learn those traffic patterns and, and take that heavy lifting off of you so that you and your teams can focus on other activities. Um, take a look at warm pools. This is a great way to have a pool of pre-initialized instances ready. Um, especially for those workloads that have a long pre-initialization time. 
So again, those, those Windows workloads, or those large AMIs, or the workloads where you're running uh, user data scripts that um, apply you know, desired state configuration using uh, you know, third-party tool. So just look into those workloads where you have those long initialization times and start to use warm pools as a way to um, offset the initialization time. Uh, and that'll allow you to be more elastic and, and start to leverage scaling policies in a way that you couldn't before uh, because you knew you couldn't bring instances into service fast enough. And then lastly, you can start to remove some of the, the manual code that you've created or, or the, the custom code that you've created for uh, managing deployments and start to look at automating those deployments with instance refresh. So again, once you've taken advantage of launch templates and you've updated your processes to, to create new launch template versions, as changes are made to your configuration, you can automate the refresh of the instances in your auto scaling group in response to that. So with that, we really appreciate you coming out today and, and listening to this webinar. We, we hope you've left this webinar uh, understanding how you can take advantage of EC2 spot instances and EC2 auto scaling groups to really create and manage resilient and efficient workloads on AWS. With that, we'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have, and we'll stick around and make sure that we get uh, those answered for you. So I appreciate it and thank you very much.